my friend, my old friend. How are you? I'm awesome. It's so good to see you. And I mean, see you. This is like, this is amazing. It is obviously not a substitute for giving you a great big hog, um, but it's, uh, I'll take it, you know? And I think this year everyone is kind of like, yeah, everyone's, everyone is zooming. Virtual hugs. Yeah. Virtual hugs and virtual yeah. rock and virtual conversations and everything. Yeah. yeah. I think the last time we saw each other was Metallica in Vancouver. I think we were hanging out and you and yes. your hubby and uh, my yeah. wife and uh, our Doug and his wife and you know, yes. Doug and we all yeah. were uh, uh, at Metallica uh, uh, rocking. It was with cool. Gojira. With Gojira, it was. Uh, uh, and I and I think that was amazing. And in fact, I, and then I was in Toronto before with Hart. And I was oh, trying to get you good. out, very and, and good, I think yeah. you were away on tour and and whatever. So, yeah. anyways, it's uh, uh it's uh, it's been uh, a long journey. Um, I I think you and I, it's, it's funny. I was thinking about about it today, and I think I mean it's twenty something years since I first started doing. Come something. on, yeah, it's it crazy. hasn't been that. And long. it's been a long time. I mean, I think the that first was so much fun. I think the first like uh, it, it was. 17, 18 years for sure. Back when I was tour managing with bands with, uh, with you, but um, I was also promoting shows back in 98 and 99. And, and uh, when I was doing some stuff at Durham college in Oshawa and some other places, Amazing. There, there you were. So it's going, I mean, here we are. Yeah. Here we are. Is right. <laughs> it's yeah. crazy. And life, I can't believe that, um, you know, we can even still be in the business in the same business for God's sake. You know, and it's fun. And I love tour managing. Um, you know, I still love it. And uh, I love it. It's like being it's like being a mother. It is my way of being a mother. Right. So I love it. Right. And I, yeah. uh, I mean, we've crossed the country many times. I, I always found myself tour managing a band. I was opening for you and and uh, you were so great uh, to um, to all the bands. And but uh, you me in particular, uh, you were really always great too, and just always giving advice and, and just uh, uh, always, always caring. And, and then I moved to Vancouver and then of course you moved to Paris and there was all this stuff and I kept missing you oh all gosh. over the place. So yeah, life goes on. Life, life is goes funny. On. A lot life of people say on. life is short, but the truth is life is long. Life is long. Yes, it can be very long. Well, welcome to the Brenton on Tour podcast. Uh, this is the Love life it. section. Uh, I'm having a blast with these things. I've, I've done uh, coffee, music, travel, and now we're Amazing. doing life. And um, I like this, this sort of story book format that I'm doing with the life series here. And um, your life is fabulous. And I want to talk about it and I want you to talk about it. And, uh, okay. and, uh, you've got a lot of things that, to teach and you've got a lot of things that you've been through. Um, and this is, you know, something that we're all experiencing together right now, which mm -hmm. is the complete shutdown of our industry. Yes. So it, there's lots to cover. So I'm, uh, I, I'm just happy to have you here to talk about all of it. So thank you for the time. Thank you. That's, That's great. great. Great, great. So you're Toronto right now? Yes, we relocated from Vancouver to Toronto in, um, uh, I, I guess it was really 2018. Mm -hmm. And we basically flipped a coin, to be honest with you. Um, you know, there was part, obviously, I, you know, it, it didn't make sense for us to move to France, which was where I was spending a lot of time. And, uh, and you know, it was just, uh, it, it, there was a, a certain fantastic thing about you know having a, a weird uh, anonymity and autonomy in a place where you know I kind of grew up my whole adult life uh being you know biff naked you know and I, like not that it was like I'm always you know really happy about that but it was just a different thing I could you know go to a different country live as an expat and if I wanted to I could just like you know go and uh you know be a nurse or go work as a porter in the American hospital, or I could, you know, it was just, and it was really creative. I could write books and it was like all the things that you hear about uh, Paris particularly are all those stereotypes are, are so true. And I did finish my memoir there. Um, and I, you know, started a lot of other writing projects there that for some reason I didn't seem to be able to get off the ground in Vancouver. And then I met my husband um, who threw a wrench in my plans because right. he was a nice boy from Cranbrook. And started playing guitar in my band, mm -hmm. and uh, and yeah, it was uh, it didn't make sense to leave Canada, you know. And um, we were going to come to Toronto or Montreal, 
and uh, flipped a coin, Toronto won. And my manager and his family are out here anyway. Uh, so it made sense for my business sure. uh, and for my life. And it's just been, it's been really great. I miss all of my friends a lot uh, on the West Coast, you know, to the point of like teary, teary phone call missing. Um, however, uh, I love it here. We live in South mm. Etobicoke area mm. and, uh, you know, I'm obsessed with the, the history of mafia. I'm obsessed with crime. I'm obsessed with all the chop shops uh, you know, we ride our BMXs in the back lanes and I always just like, you know, I'm like a hall monitor over here and it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. I feel like I, you know, miss my calling. <laughs> you met, you moved in 2018. Um, now the scene was sort of stopping in Vancouver. Dare I say, I mean, the just venues were closing like crazy and you, you had the Commodore and the Vogue and everything, but in the venue, um, there was some small ones that you and I ran into each other. You came to one of my shows at the rickshaw actually. So there was a little bit of, a little bit of that, but, um, but the scene definitely, definitely was changing. Um, yeah. And now you're in Toronto and then you moved to Toronto in which the scene never seems to stop there. So what's the, the biggest well, difference between the two cities? That's true. Well, it's hard to say because I also, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a rocker girl. Mm -hmm. So if I'm not doing rock shows, you know, I really love doing uh, all the book tours and the acoustic stuff and the speaking stuff. And that may have come with, um, age anyway because i enjoy it so much um but now in a you know in a covid time frame in a pandemic in the world and then post pandemic if there's ever going to be a post pandemic i i have to ask is there ever going to be a mosh pit again you know really legally and and the answer is maybe not but the truth is it's still happening and there are still hardcore shows that are happening every week in all these underground clubs mm -hmm. all across North America and Europe and South America. Um, there are, there are shows that still go on. They still happen. Uh, just like those underground fight clubs sure. uh, that used to happen. I mean, you know, so I think that um, things will still happen and shows will still happen. Um, it's, it's hard. It's hard for um, our generation for sure. Generation X musicians who came up yeah. to the 90s playing things like Frosh Week, you know, they don't have Frosh Weeks anymore, by the way. You know, they don't. How many of those did we do? Yeah. Did we do? <laughs> Hundreds. Like every, every, single? every year. And, and I think, you know, they don't. It's archaic. The whole idea of getting people puking drunk. I mean, you know, for their first week of university is absolutely not tolerated at all. And uh, and I just kind of go, Wow. Every every Canadian artist played these frosh weeks. It's it was like, a bit. It was almost <laughs> as it was almost as uh, you know attached to your schedule. Like if you weren't on that yeah. scene, yeah. then what were you doing? It was amazing. Like it I mean, was like it was seven amazing. bands on a, on every single show. And yes, and I mean just everyone. like yeah, and really like you know diverse, like really diverse. Yeah. You'd have like you know the coolest Toronto rappers. Uh, and like, you know, metal bands, uh, pop, pop acts. And yeah, and it was amazing because all these university, uh, you know, uh, social committees had great funding yeah. and paid for all these bands to come. I mean, it was incredible. But now things are changed. The arts have changed in Canada anyway. Um, and now it's uh, now it's very difficult. And Canada has always been a country that really supported the arts. 100%. I mean, there was so many touring grants and there was so many, you know, even uh, album, you know, opportunities to get funding Absolutely. for your record and, yeah. and factor and all these different great things that, yeah. that, um, you know, that were there. And I, uh, I just spoke to Daryl Hurst from Indie Week and he's, he's had to go online with it, but it's still a very busy schedule for them. Yeah. Um, so there is still a, uh, you know, there's still a scene. It's just buried right now. Hopefully it'll come back out. Um, unfortunately, all the clubs, you know, are, are getting affected by it. And that was a, I know you're talking about going underground, but I mean, there was still, there's still something about seeing Biff at the horseshoe. There's still uh, something, yeah. seeing, you know, and or I the mean, opera I, house or something so like that. Many, there's so many clubs right? that that, across the country that I love, you know, know, the rickshaw, like you mentioned, Yeah. Um, you know, we have to preserve these places. Um, we have to, 
and and it's yeah it's scary it's really scary time i know and it's easy for people to forget or at least uh, our business to get forgotten because everything else is taking precedent so it's sure you know uh, what are the key important factors that you know that the country and economies need to survive that's right um, we all you and i know we all need music but yeah the people who run things don't necessarily always feel that that's necessary. So we're right. going to always be at the bottom and it's our, our, our group and our, you know, we have to speak out for it and make sure that it's, it's happening. So there is lots of help out there and um, hopefully uh, people are finding it and, uh, and supporting the cause. So before you were Biff, you were Beth. And where, yeah. was, that? where was that? <laughs> Um, You know, it's really funny because um, CBC Music had put a tweet out today asking about the first slow dance uh, song. And I remember right away, it was uh, Waiting for a Girl Like You by Foreigner. Wow. And I was dancing in the grade seven dance at Mackenzie Junior High in Dauphin, Manitoba. And I'll never forget it in my life. Um, And it's funny because, uh, you know, a a lot of people can have their memories. really affect them all my memories are nostalgic I don't think it's because I block out the bad things I think that as as I get older I'm more sentimental and nostalgic and we moved from Lexington Kentucky to Dauphin Manitoba when I was 12 and my older sister was 13 my younger sister was I guess she would have been like I don't know uh 10 um and it was kind of traumatic for everybody uh it was a big change moving from Kentucky to you know, Canada's national Ukrainian capital. Uh, it was a big culture shock. And, you know, and I laugh now because I look back at those times as very serendipitous. And yeah, you know, Beth Torbert, which was my parents' last name, um, was exactly the class clown I am today. And uh, we eventually moved to Winnipeg, uh, where I went to high school and you know, tried to, you know, go to university, but I dropped out to go on tour. So it didn't really count. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm still that same girl that cut her teeth playing in, in the prairies. Do you, do you ever give thought uh, to what you would have done outside of music? Yes. All the time. Mm -hmm. All the time. I have so many other interests. Well, this year I started um, studying uh, in a course. I do a lot of volunteering. And through breast cancer, I was introduced to peer support volunteering um, with other breast cancer patients. And somehow, you know, accidentally, I kind of uh, stumbled into palliative care volunteering and Mm. realized once I was in the mix that there was a massive need for it. There was uh, not a lot of people who uh, were signing up to volunteer. And so I thought, um, this is where I belong. And I've always known that, and regardless of everything else that I do, this is something that's a a massive passion for me. And this year I uh, started uh, working towards my certification to become a death doula. So I still want to pursue that very much. And, um, you know, I I mean, there's lots of other things. I think the perfect job for me actually is hospital porter uh, so that I could talk to everybody all the time. But um, the truth is, Uh, I really know for sure there's other work that I am always called to uh, that eventually I'll probably find more time to do. And I think that that's going to be something that makes me. I've always found you to be this way. I've always found you to be, you know, uh, there's stories of absolute nightmares in this business. And then there's people who, you know, ask the front of house guy how his day is. There's a big difference between actually caring and instead of just mailing it in. And you've always been to me, that person that is, it wants to know people's stories. Like you're, how are you, Brent? How, how are you? How, how was your day? How was your wife? How are the kids daily on tour? I wasn't married then, but I'm talking about just now you're always inquisitive about what people are doing. And I think that that creates a really great vibe on tour. Are, are you like this? Uh, I can't imagine you're not like this with everybody. Cause you really seem like you're intuitive. You, you nice. really want to know, <laughs> but no, you really seem like you really want to know about people's lives, which in essence is funny why I created this podcast. Cause in this, at least version, I want to learn about people and you see, strike me as someone that always wants to learn about people and new things. And um, oh, sure. But I think that's natural for everybody. Yeah. You know, I think that all of us have that um, instinct, that curiosity, I think is natural. Mm-hmm. And it, to me, go, it, it goes back to, um, 
having that curiosity or the heart of a child. You know, there's a certain, uh, a lot of different um, theology leans into that type of thinking. And, uh, and I agree with it. It resonates with me deeply. And I think that every single person, uh, whoever it is, you know, really, you know, if you look at them as they were when they were five years old, every single person, even the douchebag driver of the F-150 that cut everybody off uh, today on the Queensway, uh, and you sit there and shaking your head, tisk tisking in your car, going, oh, my God, that guy is such a douchebag. And then I just think, but at one point, he was a five-year-old boy, and all he really wanted was, you know, whatever it was, to, to throw a baseball with his dad or, or mm -hmm. to have a cookie uh, sitting on his mom's lap or whatever the case. And I think that really that perspective and always to try really hard to see everybody in that light. Um, I mean, I don't know. It's a challenge for sure, but it's a good challenge. Uh, it's one of the biggest up. things I miss about touring right now. Um, touring introduces you to obviously every single person and yeah. attitude and everything on the planet. So you're, you're on with righties, lefties, uh, vegans, hardcore, uh, meat eaters, hardcore, uh, opinionated this opinionated that. And, and yes. you just learn so many things about, about people. And that to me is the greatest, um, thing that I'm missing about the touring side of it. The shows are oh, great. Yes. The shows are great. The, the countries are great, whatever it is, but it's the people and what you learn from people and what they're experiencing, which, and to me, that's, I really think that that's where the mental health side of it is uh, playing havoc with some of our business because oh, we're, sure. we're all used to the same thing. These are intriguing stories. People are offering intriguing thought that doesn't necessarily happen on your day to day per right. se you're not getting absolutely you know what i mean and that's that's tough yeah that's, it is hard if people do yeah you you miss your job especially if it's what you love to do and uh and unfortunately yeah it's intense being a touring um performer or being on the production side and, and still touring so you're in a traveling vessel you know if you're lucky you're in a bus but it's like a traveling jail and you know it really is in in your society in that bubble changes, your perspective gets twisted and, uh, and you, you have to see everybody else as your teacher. You know, everyone is there teaching you patience, yeah, totally. They're teaching you patience every day. And, uh, and it's always interesting. Yeah. It's, and fun. It's hard not to miss it. <laughs> and yeah, the, it. there's a laugh. I mean, it's a perpetual adolescence uh, as far as humor goes. It's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, there's a lot of um, people that have come out of Manitoba as far as, you know, artists, you know, uh, and where did you make, where did you really cut your teeth as far as uh, when you started getting a feel that this might actually happen for you? Like, woof, this, well, is, I think this it is happening. Wasn't, it had to be in Winnipeg, mm -hmm. you know, it had to be in Winnipeg. Um, Gorilla Gorilla, uh, even though I was in a band before that called Jungle Milk, which was a world music band. And really, um, that was the most nurturing introduction that I could have ever had uh, to being a vocalist in a group. It was a massive group of people. Um, and, you know, the, the repertoire was all over the place. It was uh, uh, music from dozens of cultures, and it was incredibly fun. And then being in Gorilla Gorilla was very serious. I was very, very serious. I wanted to be accepted, you know, as a female front man, you know, that was, it was very important to me. And it was hard, of course, because I was in love with a drummer. And, uh, and so navigating that, you know, I thought, well, if this goes terribly, and it, and it did eventually, I thought, I'm going to learn professionalism this way. I'm going to really learn it. And I did. And I have to credit uh, those guys. And they, everyone went on to be very successful uh, from Gorilla Gorilla. Kent Jameson uh, still works with uh, NoFX and Pennywise and all that, all, all those bands. And same with um, Brett. I always call him Booby. So I was going to say <laughs> Booby, he'll kill me. Uh, but he, you know, works with all those guys doing uh, just everything. Those guys do front of house. They do tour management. They do management. Randy Steffes was, you know, stuck man tour managing and then managing Green Day for a while. And then now, of course, he's in SNFU. Um, you know, it's just, it makes me laugh because it was 
um, yeah, it was the most beautiful introduction into being in a touring band. Did you, and, and of course the, 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 the time it's like make a demo and get it to the radio and then make, make, make a cassette and yeah. uh, maybe get it on. I mean, much was rolling, but maybe get it on good rocking tonight. Yeah. <laughs> well, something. we never had any of those aspirations with gorilla no. gorilla. I mean, if we no. could get on college radio, Nardwar mm-hmm. interviewed us and I was over the moon. Yeah. You know, that was like, if we could get on college radio, we were just like, we would never have, you know, everything else was dreaming. And uh, once I got into Chrome Dog in Vancouver, mm. that was a different story. We were going up and down the West Coast and, and playing in all the, uh, you know, all these dream venues, uh, trying to get a record deal, you know, actively pursuing uh, getting a record deal. And that was, uh, that was a whole different animal. It was, How uh, much pushback were you getting as the female? Fronted, fronted like oh, it's, it was amazing and it's why i stopped drinking you know the the thing about it was there weren't a lot of girls that i knew of uh that were in other bands and the girls that were there you know were either accused of blowing that headliner or they were blowing them right. you know and i didn't want that to ever be uh me you know and i am a very you know i was a very happy friendly uh girl after a beer and so on I talk, there's made, basically I talk too much and laughing and all this stuff and I would just lose my voice. So it was like, yeah, I don't A, ever want to be misinterpreted ever. So, you know, in order for me to always maintain, uh, you know, just what I'm trying to project, you know, just even backstage uh, with all these other acts or, or, you know, this type of thing, I, I just couldn't drink. I just could not drink. And I, you know, knew at the time, Chai Pig was a straight edge and we toured with the Wong. So he was a massive influence for me. Uh, and I was like, well, that's really cool. And he introduced me to Gail Greenwood from Belly, who at the time was in L7. And she had been a straight edge her whole life and the coolest person I ever met. So I was like, yeah, I can totally, I can totally do this. I can totally do this. Henry Rollins, you know, it was amazing to me at that time in my life. I, w- I had a huge crush on him he drank coffee so i thought well i can drink coffee if he does yeah. and that was it i just didn't drink alcohol and just never wanted to be uh, misinterpreted uh, as a female and that's something that i you know really took a lot of pride in and uh, you know there's going to be the odd person that you know assumed that i was there to you know mess around with the headliner or whatever the case there have been times when i wasn't allowed on the stage because security guards didn't know i was the singer um, but I never took it personally. And I think that's the key. Now, young women take that stuff personally. And I know a lot of bands uh, with young women uh, fronting them who will walk off the stage if anyone yells anything derogatory at them. Mm-hmm. And that is totally their prerogative to do. I commend them. Fanta- that's fantastic. Knock yourself out. That was not my generation. You know, we had to give them a knuckle sandwich. Would or- you tell them to do that still? Would you tell them now to take that approach no, or would, I wouldn't would tell, tell them, them anything, you no. know, and I never did, you know, because now I kind of, I mean, who am I to these young girls? I mean, what am I, an elder? Okay. Well, you don't want me to be your elder because I had the fist fight yeah. in a mosh pit, you know, now, you know, people don't like doing that. I had to, you know, take, I had to listen to this stuff uh, from the stage and the show had to go on. I'm not going to get kicked off the bill for being, you know, for taking it personally and, and saying this, this fan or this audience member is a misogynist. No shit. No shit. He's a misogynist. Like who, I don't care. It's not going to affect my show. It's just going to make me tougher and sound tougher. And, you know, I can't obviously admit to punching people in the front row. I can't admit that because, you know, who knows sure. years, years later they sue you. Right. However, this was something that uh, we were, uh, very inspired to do many times we just i don't know it's a different time it's a different generation yeah and it comes with the whole you hear about the you know the bands at uh trash rooms and even i think it's a famous story that uh yeah. some 41 were paid by the label to trash the room and film i it. can't imagine that that's true i don't even believe that stuff just I saying cannot see i it. you know i've i've I i've uh, i've heard rumblings from members of the band that that was the I thing and imagine. And the interesting thing is that, um, but taking it back to Motley Crue, taking it back to all these yes. bands yes. Um, uh, that were like, you know, going fight. It, it, there was sort of like 
that roughness of like, well, you know, it, fighting with the the ba, the fighting with like the crowd and fighting with fighting for your to, to have your voice heard and and it goes all the way back like Joan Jett, it goes all the way back to anyone oh, yeah. that's had to fight that's right. uh in, in you know um in that regard. And I think that um it's it's a bit different now because now yeah. there's so many options for people to to break that you don't necessarily have to claw and scratch anymore. You can just have a song in a in a in a tide commercial and it's over. <laughs> you're, yeah, you're, it's you're, very, it's very, very different today. Um, but I think that's only, I think that's also our perception, because I can imagine that any young woman who wants to be the singer of a hardcore band today yeah. Yeah. Uh, is going to be met with the same bullshit that we were met with as young women, and that's, you know, I don't know, you know, for us it was a rite of passage, you know, for us to be able to get through a show successfully, triumphantly, you know, basically changing the mind of these, you know, audience members who didn't want to see a girl up there. And I used to say the only reason that they act like that is because they're not used to seeing a chick, you know, on the mic. At that time, there was, you know, there was no video channel. There was nothing like that. So the only time they saw a chick on the stage was strippers. And so they have no other... Uh, right. way of reacting, you know, and that, that used to be how we justified it. And we'd go, oh, poor, poor little, you know, audience, they don't have any, you know, frame of reference. So we're just going to do what we do and be cool and, and give, give the best show we can give. And it's very it's, difficult not to engage with a heckler for anybody. Any comedian will tell you that and sure. anybody will tell you that. It's very difficult not to do it. And it's difficult for any band not to engage with someone who is just trying to get a rise out of the band or who's booing or who is yelling derogatory remarks. But, you know, you get through it. You're triumphant. You're, you're triumphant that show. Is there a, uh, I want to, I'll move to um, how you're feeling overall. Uh, I know you've had a battle through some stuff and, uh, and you look great. So I want to talk about that in a minute, but is there a show? What's your favorite show you've ever played? Have you thought about that? Oh yeah. All the time. There's so many shows. There's a, uh, uh, there was a show in Madrid uh, that we played that was in an in underground co club that had a hole in the ground for a toilet backstage. And that was it. And, uh, and that was amazing. There were no girls at this show. Um, and it was, uh, it was an intense little hardcore show. And that was good. But also the marquee in Halifax. No, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to claim that it was overpacked or oversold because that would be against the law. However, it was so packed with bodies in there and uh, everyone was sweaty. And it was one of those shows that in my memory, the audience was all shirtless, you know, like, oh, they're all shirtless because it was just a, a massive mosh pit. It was a total mosh pit. It was just a sea, a swimming, moving sea. And there was so much sweat. It was so hot. There was so much sweat. The sweat condensation from the bodies was on the ceiling, yeah. raining on us on the stage. It was disgusting. And we were soaking wet. I don't know how we didn't get electrocuted, but it was the most glorious, best ever um, feeling. You know, it was like, this is, I could have died happy. I could have died happy a million times in my life. And that was definitely one of them. Well, I mean, they love to, they love music in the maritime. So uh, yeah. I remember, I mean, I did one of those shows with you. I don't know if that's the one you were talking about. I've, I've done a marquee with you and it was great. And it was oh, yeah, amazing. The marquee so. was great. And I think we probably did Moncton together too, which oh, was yeah. like. Oh, you're out there. You're out there. <gasps> I love. Uh, so how are you feeling? Fun. How are you feeling overall? How, 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 you've, uh, I feel great. You know, I yeah. just did a, um, a, a, a online thing yesterday for a cancer organization. And I forget. Uh, what it's like because it's been a long time since I was a patient mm -hmm. every once in a while I think I'm going to have a recurrence of course because everyone always thinks that every headache is a recurrence um, but you know breast cancer was a, an amazing journey for me and at the time that I was diagnosed with breast cancer there was no Instagram you know mm -hmm. there was not a lot of other women uh, that were my age at the time I was in my 30s early 30s and I didn't know anybody alive who had breast cancer. I certainly didn't know any young women. Um, so it was, it was a really isolating and weird time, but I still felt like I had to have the top hat and cane on every time I went into the waiting room. Well, what I discovered uh, was that I met so many people 
uh, who were going through so much. Every woman I ever met who had breast cancer had to work during cancer, just like me. I had to make a record yeah. uh, when I could barely sing. Uh, Jason Dar is a hell of a producer. Um, and uh, they all had to work. Most of them, like me, uh, didn't have their medication covered unless it absolutely targeted the cancer cell. You know, for example, and this is just stuff that I learned as a patient. I had gotten a blood clot in my surgical port uh, and it was really, you know, really awful. So I had to take these injections of um, basically a, a blood thinner, if you will. It was uh, called heparin, uh, but it was a fragment. I don't know if, who, what brand it was, but anyway, they were pre-filled syringes and I had to take them every day. I had to give myself an injection of this like low molecular weight shit to keep my blood thin so that I wouldn't have a stroke, which I eventually had anyway, but long story. Mm. Anyway, it wasn't covered. And I was like, this is a thousand bucks a month. Why is this not covered? And they're like, well, it doesn't affect the cancer cell. Hmm. And so it's not covered. Like literally, and I just thought, well, then what do people do? You know, I mean, I don't know. Who has a thousand dollars a month? And they were like, well, they just don't take it. And I was just like, are you kidding? My baby aspirin take an ass. Like, are you kidding me? And it gave me a big insight into the reality of being a patient in this country and i think things are probably worse now and it varies it's different from province to province but it is it, it still that much is it still that much uh, i don't know, you know but right now it's just like i mean yeah things are so there's so much inequality when it comes to health care um yeah if you don't have extended medical and i don't know all of us musicians do not have medical plans uh, we pay for our own dental stuff. We pay for our, uh, all our health care. Um, you know, you are, it, is, it was just so eye-opening. And, uh, and it just got me into um, learning about what's going on in this country when it comes to health care and when it comes to uh, the bureaucracy and, and social services and stuff like that. And I'm, yeah, I'm still, I'm still discovering more. Even yeah. moving to this province is different from B.C., um, and they're all, they're all bad. And of course, the, everything can be improved for everybody, but I the, learned a lot. The social media at the time, though, you were very active on and keeping us posted on your journey. So um, I think people uh, were inspired by that and also um, oh, learned, learned a lot. And uh, here you are with us still and inspiring people and still making music and still playing shows. So here we are. So um, my, uh, our, our, you know, your guitar player, Doug, a uh, great friend of, uh, of mine and um, one of the great uh, discoveries of my journey through this uh, musical land uh, has mentioned that you guys are uh, working on some stuff. So what are you doing right now to keep active and keep creative? Are you creating music, writing new records? Or are you just consistently writing and to just keep that, muscle going well we did write a new record so doug and snake and myself wrote a record called champion Excellent. and this year our first single was put out on valentine's day it was called jim i saw that and yeah. we had so the way that i wanted to do the record um uh, chronologically was i wanted this song first this song second this song third because really for me if i just kind of believe that if i just release the record all at once people are just going to cherry pick they'll listen to 10 seconds of each song and they'll just like you know listen to whatever order they want to listen in and i thought no it has to be in the, this order and so jim was first and then our second single uh, was going to come out in may uh, but of course we were just starting to become entangled in the pandemic and i felt like uh it's not important i just thought this is more important this is more important uh than my single you know so i just thought i'm gonna wait and then our third single was supposed to come out in august it was a very very specific song uh and i love autumn so it was like you know really important time and then by the time august rolled around i'm just like yeah not only do i not want to go and put out the second single i certainly am not ready to put out the third single so in a way that was um, basically me trying to respect the fact that in this world, there are many more important things uh, than our fucking record. <laughs> you know, there's just like more important things to focus on. More voices need to be heard than mine, uh, especially this year. 
Um, you know, I think that there has been a lot of change that's happened. Uh, Black Lives Matter, um, indigenous um, issues that are still going on in Canada. These things are important. And I just think that my record can wait, you know, and that's always kind of how I felt. And now here we are, it's autumn. And, uh, and so what we have been doing is kind of tinkering and tweaking a little bit with uh, the songs that were already recorded. And the mm. good news is Fury's out here now. Yeah, so of amazing. course uh, we go down there and, uh, and we will be there doing our show for Juju um, on the 30th. And we're going to do it at Doug's. That's amazing. I was speaking to Doug about it the other day. Hey, Doug, Fury, awesome. how are you, buddy? Awesome. Thanks for uh, connecting us again. Um, and you mentioned Jay and Riley. So, hey, Jason, Riley. Hi, guys. Hi, how are you? Doing? Good to see you. Um, anyway, so yeah, you're gonna um, you're gonna do this show, and you're gonna do it for Juju, which uh, is a great uh, online tool for for uh, bands to uh, bring their fans into and. Um, and enjoy this live experience that might be a little different than what they're used to. And, and sort of, instead of going Instagram live, uh, Rain Meta, uh, our, our Canadian musician brethren is, uh, is a big part of it. And I think it's awesome that you're doing it. So um, tell you. me a little bit about when that's going down and what it's, uh, what it's all about. Well, you know, I think that um, I've never done a streaming show ever. I've never done anything like that. We did uh, a couple of things for uh, a couple of different charities over this last um, six or seven months. Uh, but, you know, only once or twice and only one or two songs kind of thing. Uh, so this is the very first time I've ever done a streaming show. And if it wasn't for Rain asking me, I probably would never have even done it. Uh, so I'm very happy about it. And because it's October 30th, I mean, it's going to be halloween -y, So sure. we're going to make it a little bit special. Uh, in that way. And uh, it's an acoustic show with Snake and Doug and Mish and me. And so we're excited about it. So uh, Juju Live uh, is where they can find it, right? And, um, That's right, jujulive.ca. .ca, yeah, uh, yeah, to see uh, Biff and team live on uh, yeah. October 30th from Doug's basement, which is going to yes. be great uh, in this yeah. old ancient uh, century old house he's got in london so it's awesome yes so good for you that's i um, uh so the record will wait but we get to see you live uh, very very shortly that's uh, right. which is uh, happening this week so uh, amazing and i uh, can't wait to tune in for that so cool. uh bivy my friend um it is so great to see you it has been way too long and uh i yeah. can't uh I can't thank you enough for making the time to come on today and tell a bit about your tale. Uh, and uh, just thank you for all you've done for me, for my career. Uh, I'm still trucking away, trying to pay, make people like you that have, have given so much to me. Like, uh, well, there's one of my little minions that I've sent out and he's still kind of doing his thing. So I appreciate all the time that you've, uh, we appreciate that you've you. invested. So it's awesome. It's very thank great. Thank you. Thank and, you. All the best to you and Snake and everybody, and uh, have a great show this week. Uh, everyone can find it at uh, jujulive.ca. So this is the wonderful Biff Naked. This has been the life of Biff so far. And this has been the Brenton on Tour podcast. And I appreciate you guys all for listening. So rock on. <laughs>